it may shock you with how quickly the AI will be able to start solving these problems. It may turn out to actually be a little bit easier problem than people think rather a harder problem because it could be that these different data streams complement themselves so well that they actually converge more to the problem rather than making it a thornier or harder problem. You know, when I look at it from the outside, I'd say, oh, you add one more dimension in, in any sort of thing in engineering, it's a harder problem. It's just a bigger solution space, much harder to work. But it may be that somehow putting the, the embodiment where you have motion and, um, and, and vision combined together with, um, with tactile and then also a large language model, you never know what might come out of it. And it may be that we'll be very surprised by the fall on what these bots will be able to do and be able to see that there's easily a path forward to implementing them in the factory and doing useful work. Welcome in everyone. Today I have the pleasure of having Herbert from Brighter with Herbert and Scott, uh, also known as Going Ballistic on Twitter, um, who is a robotics company two-time founder, actually, and very knowledgeable in the field. And today we're actually going to be speaking quite extensively on the current state of the humanoid robot sector, which, I mean, 2024 has just been a frenzy of news, it seems like, in this space. And Herbert and Scott, you've both had the pleasure of conducting a number of great in-depth interviews with a number of CEOs, uh, as well as hosting a number of conversations between industry insiders and um, just really been following the space very, very closely this year. And so I wanted to go ahead and invite you on so that we could have sort of a little bit of a debrief session on uh, what the latest and greatest news is and then where you would rank in your mind kind of the the hierarchy of significance of news and where you see various bot companies then we'll get to dive also into an incredible resource that you have put together uh just trying to grade and kind of rank various players in the industry and so um yeah herbert why don't you just kick us off and i'll let you give me some of your like recent highlights and favorite uh, insights that you've seen in the humanoid robot space this year. Thank you so much, Hans. This is fantastic. I really love this topic as Scott and I have done well over 30 different videos at this point. I think the humanoid bot um, industry has just, just skyrocketed out of nowhere. It's now fast and furious. It's changed too. I think in just a few months ago, we were all looking at these humanoid companies and we were, you know, we're really looking at whether or not they can build the humanoid hardware, right? Can can they have the ability to walk? Many of the Chinese companies, as you'll learn, they really focus so much on the bipedal uh, locomotion and being able to maintain its balance. Then there's others who focus so much on the hands and the dexterity of the fingers. Uh, and that has now moved Beyond that, in just in the last month, now we're seeing one company after another dropping demos and they're outdoing each other, right? There's Tesla dropping the Gen 2 platform, which shows you now that the hardware is near its kind of a design comp lock completion already. It's very close. You'll see that you don't see any dangling wires, the battery is compact, and it's now able to move and everything's now neural net controlled. Even the legs, which is a month ago, it wasn't yet. Then you have figure raising $675 million, but it's the partnerships that they have, right? It's the partnerships like OpenAI and NVIDIA and uh, Amazon. Uh, Jeff Bezos was an investor in Microsoft. Just out of nowhere comes out. They've, they've now have a partnership with BMW. So the story is moving beyond just, you know, what can you do in terms of the hardware? Now we're showing, can you show end-to-end -end autonomous teaching and learning and that itself is, is just progressed faster than even the uh, vendors themselves were expecting. So really in the next, this next, the rest of this year, we're going to start hearing more about deployment into actual uh, customer sites. We're going to actually see useful work and we're going to see more about the brains and the ability for the bot to learn useful tasks and to be doing it. And of course, we're still going to see, you know, one bot after another outdoing each other. We just had, uh, what is it, a Phoenix for the first time last week. They showed human speed 
two hands being able to sort blocks, two hands at the same time, but at human speed. We saw, uh, was it Agility and Digit showing that they can actually are now as fast as a human or actually faster than a human in terms of its ability. I'm sorry, that was, that was what was that? Uh, Unitree. Unitree was now. Unitree for walking, yep. For walking faster than a human, a world record for a humanoid. Uh, and so forth. So yeah, these are the things that uh, we, we need to be watching out for for the rest of the year. Awesome. And uh, let's, same question to you, Scott, what are your favorite takeaways so far in 2024 for the field of humanoid robotics? And and then maybe from there, if you wanted to just elaborate on what the, the overall significance of humanoid robotics mm. just kind of exploding at this point in time is. Okay, I think the, the first thing is that um... Back in 2023, if you started to talk, well, even in 2022, talking about humanoid robots, there was kind of a stigma attached to it that, uh, of course, you're not serious. It's, it's decades away. It's not really going to happen. Um, but it was really just a small group that were looking at it and taking it actually quite seriously, including obviously the, the robot vendors that were, were building these bots. And now since 2024, with some of these announcements, it's starting to captivate the public in general, I mean, 60 Minutes did an article about it. So now you know it's suddenly bubbling up to the mainstream. You're starting to see a lot more Wall Street analysts and everything taking it kind of seriously, looking at this. Some of the articles that are in Bloomberg that aren't just looking at the figure AI, but also looking at what uh, agility is doing. So I'm beginning to see that the, the stigma has gone away because they're realizing that these companies are doing quite a bit. Now, when Herbert says they're outdoing one another, no company has really been able to do everything all in one package yet. They all have their strengths and they're trying to say, well, all right, they did something impressive here, but we'll show you what we can do over here, which is better. So some of them are really good with the hands. Some are really good with walking. You know, some of them are, are, are going to be pretty good at showing like AI and, and being able to do the training. You know, Tesla is just showing perhaps the one that's the most elegant of all of them, but none of them have really got everything there. So, but what that means, if you look at each individual piece, once you're able to put them together, that tells you that they really are coming. So that sort of validates that everything is really going on, let's say, almost according to plan. It's going to happen. And uh, I think that's sort of the biggest takeaway I've had is that it's not just one company that's finding a lot of success in here. It's many companies are doing it. And I think probably the biggest thing has been the AI is taking off way faster than everyone expected. and um, I really like what Brett said back in the fall that, you know, he felt the AI was going to take a lot longer than the hardware. And now he changed his mind on that. And my mind was pretty much the same. It's going to take a while. So when I said uh, about Tesla, when they came out with the Tesla bot, that, you know, their prototype will be hard, their production will be easy. It's because I really thought that, you know, getting the brains going and getting it training, something like that was going to be challenging. It was going to take a long time. Yeah, some challenges in the hardware, but for the most part, you, you could solve that riddle. And now it seems like, we might be waiting actually on really good hardware to get what we want. But the other thing to keep in mind is that too many people are focusing, and I think in the early days focused on the idea of a humanoid bot being something for home use. That's still a ways away. There's still a lot you have to do to perfect that, to really be ready to put in consumers' hands. But it's not long before it starts doing useful work in factories. And we're going to go through that list in a second here, because I think some of them are very close to hitting that milestone if they have not already demonstrated it to a point that we can practically say, yes, we're seeing it as definitely the glimmers of useful work. And it's just a matter of, of you know, months, less than years before we can really say that they are performing useful work and actually justifying their cost. Can I uh, answer the question of why humanoids? So the humanoid, uh, the labor industry is the single largest industry by um, you know my magnitudes, right? It's what fifty percent of the global the GDP, and it's forty trillion dollars, ten times larger than the automotive industry. You know the the labor industry, and so if you are able to create a general a purpose humanoid bot, if it's designed like a human, the world is designed like a human. You don't need to make any changes and any retrofit to any environment. You can just plop one in because if a human can do it in that factory or that uh, location of um, the business that they have, then the bot can do it as well. A, a great uh, quote somebody told me was, you could put a humanoid bot into a, into, a, into a Home Depot and it'll be able to use all of the tools that are being sold there. 
<laughs> yeah, so you don't need to create any net new kind of tool for it to be able to use. It'll just use the same hammer, the same drill, the same, you know, uh, gardening tools that they have. And so that's why th there's so much effort to creating a humanoid bot, but clearly there's going to be a role and a tremendous amount of opportunity for any kind of bot, any intelligent bot that is purpose uh, designed can still be successful. But the humanoid in particular can be used in so many different um, industries and so many skill sets and, and uh, activities that it could really be the largest industry that's ever out there ever. Absolutely. And one of the fun things to think about, you know, building on Scott's point about people really thinking about how a, a robot or, you know, a humanoid robot could be useful to them in their home. I know that's a, you know, that's a pain point that every person feels, Hey, I wish someone could fold my laundry and do my dishes. And, you know, there's just like all kinds of general tasks around the house that need to be done, their chores. But, you know, the reality of the situation is that those tasks the reason that we have to do them is because there's not a whole lot of economic value in hiring someone else to do those things. Whereas your employer will pay you a very large sum of money to go into whatever job it is that you do. If you do something that is direct labor to go and spend eight hours there, like you're not willing to pay someone to come into your home and do tasks in your home, the same as the factory that you work for will pay you to come into the factory and do an eight hour shift of creating widgets or, you know, cooking meals or whatever the, whatever the job is. And so that's why, you know, those more specialized and also more employable skills, that's where the value in the economy is assigned. And that's one of the reasons why you'll see humanoid robots working on those types of jobs first before we see it coming into the home. And it's the same exact reason why that's why those are the same jobs that get paid more in the economy today as well. Yeah, it, it's the same with any technology. Uh, it, computers were originally developed to be used in businesses, not in homes. It took a long time before the cost came down in, in usability um, to, to bring it in the home. And remember when the PC first arrived, everyone was asking, it's like, what do you need in the home for? I mean, they couldn't imagine. It's like, oh, you can store recipes on it? So what? What's the big deal? They, they couldn't see the use case in the home. Same thing with cell phones. When they, The mobile phones were really for people that really needed it. Businessmen who were, were going around and could justify that cost, but most people just say, I, I cannot see it. So until the cost curve comes down and makes it affordable, you won't see it. So right now, there is that economic justification to come up with a humanoid robot, albeit even if it's imperfect. All it has to be able to do is perform certain tasks that right now you cannot automate because they're, you just cannot find a way to automate it. And it, it does have a labor cost to it that you could easily replace. And again, I want to be very careful about replace. A lot of times it's not so much about replacing, it's just actually finding someone to do the task. Because in many cases, there are these labor shortages. It's very difficult to go and, and fill those gaps. So it's going to be plugging holes in many places. Well, there's a lot of attrition going on there, a lot of people retiring. And so there is actually a very strong need for it, which is why you were seeing companies looking that way, not just building the bots. Because I think that's the other thing that was very important in 2024 when we learned about the BMW um, agreement with Figure is it wasn't about that there was a company called Figure that's thinking of building bots, but that there were CEOs of all the major Fortune uh, 100 companies that are actively out there looking at how they can start using humanoid bots in their companies and looking to do these pilots. So that means behind the scenes, they're doing it and they're not doing it very publicly, again, because there's kind of the stigma associated with it. But now it's almost flipping the, the, the script. Everyone's like, like, well, are you thinking about using human right robots and why aren't you? Yeah, that is a, a huge implication. Um, and I think it's hard to underestimate the, as a, someone who managed a small business myself, the amount of pain that people at every level of an organization feel when it comes to filling, especially the types of jobs that no one really wants to do in the first place. You know, there's all kinds of labor that needs to be done, but there aren't that many people that really want to do that job because they can find other things to do that are a better use of their time. And so, you know, if we can create automation 
that can take care of those tasks. Just like, you know, there's a lot of data entry right now that's automated by software. And well, the reason for that is that that's not a fun job for a human to do. And honestly, humans are not great at the attention that kind of needs to be paid continually over long periods of time to do that type of task because it is so mind-numbingly boring. And so these are the low-hanging fruit of tasks that you know we're going to be automating here in the near future with humanoid robots as well. Things that are dull, things that are dangerous, um, things that are boring. So <clears throat> with that said, I wanted to go ahead and ask what are the who well I guess one the first question will be are there some specific players that everyone just needs to keep their eyes on? And then part two of that question is how do you look out for new and emerging players at this point in time, since it seems like we continue to have kind of new mm -hmm. entrants popping up continually? So so how do you choose who it is that you're paying attention to and how much attention they're getting. Um, would either of you like to take that question first specifically? I'll start and I'll let Herbert uh, finish it off. So I, I think the, the first thing is that you know, we are out there trying to see who's there, but in many cases, all you have to do is be on X and someone will end up posting it to you. So we'll end up getting tagged on a lot of these things before we even have a chance to find it. So that's one thing. It's like, it's like literally they're almost kind of starting to come to us so we're able to go through. And we've decided to compile a list. And our biggest concern was that when you compile any list, it always has like a top and it has a bottom. And everyone assumes that when you're, you're sorting it, you're, you're giving it a rank. And we really wanted to be careful of like, oh, how, how do you kind of rank these things without everyone thinking that you're sort of picking favorites or something like that. So we put a lot of effort into thinking of putting together something that would show some of the things that we know that's been publicly available, hoping to prompt a many of these other companies to provide us the information that's missing because we're pretty sure they've done some of these things. It's just that it's not on their website. We haven't seen any posted. They haven't told us. And the result is, of course, we are starting to get more and more interviews with more of these CEOs. We've already talked about a couple. And, uh, you know, it's nice to know that we're going to have a little bit more. And Herbert can talk a little bit more about what it's almost like. It, it, it's sort of like setting up a league table, okay? It's like, where is everyone? Where kind of the standings are? And maybe you get some that are kind of vying for first place or something like that. And, and we've got a couple of leagues here. We've, we've got sort of like, you know, the, the American League and the Chinese League, if you look at that. So you just imagine two Major League Baseball teams here. And we divide it up that way. So just because the Chinese bots are in the bottom of it, it's because usually the AL comes at the top and the NL comes at the bottom, right? We're not trying to rank anything here. And for the most part, it's just, it's the preseason things where the sportscasters are going through and say, yeah, I think the Yankees look pretty good this year. You know, I'm penciling them up at the top right now, but we don't really know because it's a grapefruit league, right? And, and no one is really playing their best starters yet because they're trying to get everyone conditioned for opening day. So right now we can sort of handicap it a little bit and say these, these companies seem to be pretty good, but there's a couple other dark horses out there we don't know much about. And we're finding a little bit more and we're getting to get more and more impressed. And so what's telling us is that it's going to be an interesting season, okay? Uh, and let, let's see where we are in the fall when it gets time for the fall classic and where we are. And we almost think it's an Olympic year. We got to start getting close to having some bot Olympics because a lot of them are performing some pretty good things. We, we want to run a decathlon out there and start seeing how some of them score. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, we are at such an early part of this humanoid bot industry and and at the same time, there's an explosion of companies out there. So it's 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 li really literally impossible for us to keep track of everything that's happening out there. There's likely, very likely, dozens and dozens and dozens that we are not even aware that exist today. So we basically are looking for the companies out there who have publicly shown demos, who've shown videos, whether it's on X or YouTube, that's been shared with us. Uh, we know that there's dozens and dozens of, if not hundreds, of Chinese uh, humanoid robot companies. And so we're trying to understand better who they are. It's funded by the government. They, they're incenting them to, and I, we believe that they're 
well, the, the, the kind of grand challenge that they've been asked to do is the ability to bipedal locomotion and the movement and the balance. And so that's why you see a lot of the Chinese uh, manufacturers are showing off their ability to walk and the ability to keep balance. Uh, but it, it, there's just so many companies that are popping out. We don't know many of them. And so one quick way to uh, kind of categorize them, which would be which of these vendors have uh, publicly said that they're commercially available or commercially intention versus the ones that are really just research. As an example, the one company, if you ask anybody in the public, do you know of that's on humanoid bots, they'll say it's Boston Dynamics. But the interesting thing is Boston Dynamics publicly have said that their Boston Dynamic Atlas bot that you all love and seen many times is research. It is not intended for commercial use. It's so big, big and bulky. It's using um, pneumatic uh, powered actuators, and that is not in any way safe to be a cobot working closely with humans side by side. And it was never designed. It's never going to be the cost required for it to be sold to companies at all. And yet that's the one people think of. So I think the first thing we did is let's research, uh, let's break it out between commercial versus research. And then from there, I think Scott can tell you the three things that we look for to evaluate each vendor from each other, which ones you know, which are the three areas that, uh, that bot vendors are really focusing on? Yeah. So, um, you know, the first thing is looking at th three key things, uh, that, that have to be accomplished. Uh, one is mobility. So working on bipedalism or some way of being able to move around, hopefully bipedalism, otherwise it's not really a humanoid form. Then there's the dexterity you need in the hands to be able to, to, um, manipulate and, and operate in the environment. And then of course there's the brains that's going to be connecting them all together. And while they're all working on it in certain areas, some of them are much stronger in one area than another. And some of them are maybe outright kind of like, well, not worrying about that right now. We're trying to solve one or two of those aspects of it before we move on to the next. And a lot of them are of course going to be getting help from the outside. So developing the brain is, is very complicated. In many cases, partnerships are being formed with these robot companies and a lot of artificial intelligence companies to help them come up with those solutions. And so you're seeing right now, um, many AI companies that want to do embodied AI, and they're looking for these robot chassis right now to start using for the embodiment to start solving that part of it. And this is gonna be rather exciting going forward because a lot of people have felt that as you start to put the two together, you start getting these true multimodalities going on here, with AI and embodiment, it may shock you with how quickly the AI will be able to start solving these problems. It may turn out to actually be a little bit easier problem than people think rather harder problem, because it could be that these different data streams complement themselves so well that they actually converge more to the problem rather than making it a thornier or harder problem. You know, when I look at it from the outside, I'd say, oh, you add one more dimension in, in any sort of thing in engineering, it's a harder problem. It's just a bigger solution space, much harder to work. But it may be that somehow putting the embodiment where you have motion and, um, and, and vision combined together with, um, with tactile and then also a large language model, you never know what might come out of it. And it may be that we'll be very surprised by the fall on what these bots will be able to do and be able to see that there's easily a path forward to implementing them in the factory and doing useful work. So is this a good time for us to go ahead and look at here is the the material that y'all have put together, mm -hmm. which is this is just a great resource for understanding like just doing some basic lay of the land. Here's where various players kind of stand in their progress towards this problem. Um, so yeah, let's go ahead and just begin to walk us through what we have here. Okay, so what we're seeing here are kind of the, the two different leagues that we were talking about. And so we decided to use a little bit of um, a baseball metaphor here and looking at sort of the, the player milestones that you, you have out here for each of the different teams and sort of organize it into, if you want to call it, you know, the AL. And I will remind you, Toronto is in the American League, okay? So we do have a Canadian team in the American League. And of course, we have a Canadian team here, which is Sanctuary AI in there. We also have a team from, from Europe, from, uh, from Norway, which is as 1X Technologies. So they are basically in, if you want to call it the Blue League. 
And then the red lead we have in there are the uh, all the companies that we know of coming out of China that have really made significant progress and have displayed a lot of capability so far to, to date. Um, what we find is is funny uh, looking at that. I guess Toyota Research just recently got added in there is the dearth of companies coming out of either Japan or Korea. I was expecting a lot more. Still is also more coming out of Europe. So that seems to be the um, the companies that have been set up. And we're looking at these different um, uh, milestones that they've all done. We've also put together some baseball cards for each of them that we go through and look at their capabilities. Just like, you know, any sort of baseball card, you get the height and the weight, and, you know, the batting average and stuff like that. And we're trying to make them as uniform as possible. The problem is they all have their own statistics. So it's really hard to compare everything. So some of them might say what the payload is or what the speed is. And those are kind of aspirational and not necessarily been demonstrated yet. So they'll kind of be in there um, in that way. And, and now what we need to do first is a, is a shout out to our, our colleague, um, CERN Basher, who put these, these together. He's um, a whiz when it comes to Excel sheets and really being able to format data in a way and has done a lot in the research and really thinking about how you want to come up with these different columns to get an idea of what are significant milestones and what was sort of the best way to, again, we, we load to say rank because we don't really want to say whether anyone's in first, second or third place, but we do want to give an idea of, of who is up there, who are the major contenders that we're seeing right now. So the first thing, of course, the names of the bots that, that we're seeing out there, whether they've released any sort of bot video on X or YouTube that you can go and take a look at, um, and whether they're in a commercial focus. So that's going to be very important to whether seeing, you know, more milestones coming out. And then of course, whether there's any, any demonstration of public walking, you know, demonstrating that there is some sort of mobility. There are some that have mobility, but the mobility, uh, may be, uh, without legs, you know, they're using, um, a, a mobile platform, which is based on wheels. Um, and then again, you know, hands, the capability of hands, what type of hands may be there. Um, and then demonstration of you know useful work. So it's one thing to show a bot that's able to walk and walk quickly and do everything else. It's all very, very impressive. But the next question is like, well, can the bot do anything? Can it actually lift a load and move around? And someone who has shown uh, that capability or have hinted that they're getting pretty close to doing something like that. Um, and in many cases, the, you know, the colors we're putting in there, they might tend to get darker shades as we feel they get closer to really hitting the top of the milestone. So for instance, if we look at agility in the third line, you know, demoed useful work. So they've shown some, you know, examples of that as well as many others have, where they may have shown lifting up a part, moving it around that you could, you could definitely see being done in the workplace. But I would say at this point, agility has gone a little bit more and really showing us not so much a lab or bench setup, but, you know, more of, of something that's actually in a factory type of setting and doing it. And last week they released another video, you know, demonstrating what they could do and what the benchmarks were. So what's interesting is that, up till now, the videos didn't tell us very much except that things were moving around. Then you look at it and realize, oh, it's a 3X video or it's, it's not in real time. And you're guessing at the walking speed. Now they're starting to release some snippets of statistics. I would call it like the saber metrics now that we can get an idea of exactly how they're performing. So we're getting an idea how fast they're walking or what they are compared to a human cycle time now. That's coming in there. And agility demonstrated something. They said it's like 75% of the cycle time for the human in this particular task getting mighty close. And they were able to, to accomplish the seven and a half hour shift. Like, oh, that's very good. So it's not just showing it that it could do it for half an hour, but you know, doing something over a long duration, which is gonna be very important. So we see they're getting closer and closer. And I would also point to you that there was a, a Bloomberg article today about agility and talking about that. And um, so the, the, the results are getting in an Amazon factory that they are doing a, a pilot in right now. Uh, and a lot of the rationale and the reason. So they're doing something that's very simple. It's just taking totes off a shelf and putting it on the conveyor. Looks really easy. And you think, oh, okay, so any sort of robot should do that. But why'd they pick that? Part of it's because it's easy. And second, and this really surprised me, it turns out that's where Amazon gets most of the injuries. So, and, and fines and everything else, doing that particular thing. So they are highly motivated because they're getting a lot of worker injuries in what seems to be a very simple task that they want the robots to do that. Again, I'd like you to look at it because it's it tells you a lot about agility. It's it's interesting that when agility gets ready to uh, to recharge the robots, they literally take a nap on the floor. It's really it's kind of cute to watch the the bots kind of sitting down there, <laughs> resting, getting ready to get the charge before the next one's going up. So, 
again, seeing an article like that coming from Bloomberg is telling me that it's starting to percolate into, you know, the the mainstream, um, not, you know, media, but also perception that, hey, these bots are coming, and we should start thinking about it because they're a lot closer than we think. So well, Scott and I have interviewed the CEO of Figure AI, we've interviewed the CTO of Sanctuary, and we've got interviews set up with Fourier Intelligence, uh, a China-based company, uh, Aptronic, Agility, and 1X Technologies as well. Those are coming. And then we are clearly trying to uh, reach out to the other Chinese automatic, uh, robot manufacturers as well. So the one thing about this table is that this is only things that we have seen publicly, right? There's there's very there's probably a lot of things here wrong, and I'm sure that you know some of the companies might claim and say, hey, how come you don't have this color for this column, and and they'll be correct because it's just we haven't known about, it. and that's why we're trying to talk directly with the uh, executives of these companies to really understand. But the way I'll break down this table is I would I would uh, lump together at this point again just based on today and what we only know right now is Tesla, Figure AI. Aptronic and um, and One X Technology. Or no, let's see. Aptronic, Agility, Aptronic, Tesla, Figure AI. I'd lump them all into one. These are humanoid robots that have that are really focused on all three parts, right? Which is the brains, walking, and very importantly, the hands is is critical as well. Uh, Sanctuary. They have taken a different approach where they are. They've said that they're they're actually um, not necessarily thinking that it's their humanoid robot that matters. They want they plan to partner with as many different humanoid robot companies out there, and they focus on two things. One is uh, their their executive team is really uh, coming from the AGI AI background, and then the the dexterity of the fingers and the hands is what really truly matters because that's what's going to determine usefulness of the bot. And they want to take the intelligence that they are able to build and partner with other humanoid robots out there. Agility digits very different from all the rest. If you take a look at the, their humanoid bot, it does not look like a human, but it is bipedal. They call it bipedal, and it's designed. What they decided to do was instead of instead of building it like a human, their concept of first principle is let's go to the factory and build it first principles based on what would be best to pick and place uh, packages. And so if you see their bot, it's light, it's it's designed to be able to grab boxes and move it very quickly and pivot quickly. And they are actually uh, one of the companies that's already planning to build a the first to build a manufacturing for a fa facility to build 10,000 robots. And they're one of the first to be able to show that they're already in a commercial Set, uh, setting with a commercial partner actually doing useful work for that commercial partner already. So their strategy was, let's get right into the customer right away. Let's learn from that. And later we will build the hands and the the feet and the, the ability to walk a little bit better based on that knowledge. And then you've got 1X Technologies. Their approach was to start with wheels. And so that's what Eve is. Eve has no hands and no legs. It does have knees, and so it can bend up and down. But it's basically got, you know, it's like us on skateboards, on wheels at the bottom. And it allows them to be able to, their focus is really to do useful work using the hands and be able to move faster with the wheels. But they do have a plan for the next generation called Neo, which is the traditional humanoid that uh, Tesla, Figure AI, and um, Aptronic are doing as well. Um, and then you've got Fourier Intelligence from China, which they did was they came out of this from a physiotherapist, uh, physiotherapy kind of perspective. They are actually building the robotic robotic hands and the kind of uh, tools that a person with, if a person who's disabled would use to help them with their physiotherapy. And then they took that and then expanded into a human or robot. So they really they each camp come from different areas. Now. Uh, Apollo, Uptronic there, they named their bot Apollo because they come from the NASA partnership. They have a partnership with NASA. They've done this for uh, many, many years now. And so again, each one of these come from a different background and perspective. And unfortunately, we just don't know enough about the Chinese ones. And so we are at this point going to go and spend a lot more time exploring those and do, doing deep dives with those kind of companies. Mm -hmm.
Yeah, and I think just to you know, follow up on um, the approach that Agility was was making is that they realize there's a lot of useful work you can go out there where you don't need fully formed hands. So you just have like paddles, you'd be able to pick everything up. You don't need to have the full digits. So they wanted to accelerate and get into the workplace. They also, they have legs, but their their legs are, it looks like their knees are backwards. So they, they walk more like an ostrich because they found that that was a very efficient way of being able to get bipedal motion. And again, you know, uh, as Herbert was saying, once they had sort of solved the problem because they literally built it from the ground up, they, they learned how to walk first. And then if you're, okay, what, what goes above the legs? What should we put in there? And they tried thinking about everything. What should we design there? And they realized that, hmm, okay, there's a reason why nature came up with the torso and the arms the way they did and everything else. So they kind of looked at that and decided that, oh, that's not a bad approach. And again, they're looking at how can we move to, together really quickly without having to solve all the problems. And you will see that many others are doing the same thing. You know, Sanctuary has decided that the mobility problem is something that they're not going to focus on because we know it can be solved. I mean, you can look around and say, hey, there's a lot of companies out there doing walking. And a lot of them are, are learning to walk really quickly. So it means when it's our turn to be able to do that, we'll be able to solve it. We can throw the resources on it. But right now, we don't think that's an important area of focus. So you can see each one of them has their own strategy. Um, I don't think that one of them is necessarily better or worse than another. I'm actually glad they're all taking different approaches because they're all taking the same approach. We might all end up in a dead end. And we know usually that's the way AI search algorithms work and everything else. You try going in different directions all the time because one of those or two of those might actually be the path that shows you the solution. Hey, Hans, can we step back a little bit? I think it's important for us to have the conversation of one of the ways that we categorize this is the Chinese bots versus the Western bots, right? And I think it's really critical, important for us to have this conversation. And in China, the government has made a proclamation uh, that they intend to be to have the most humanoid bots deployed by 2025. That's next year. And they want to be the leader in humanoid bot industry by 2027, the leader. And this is backed by, you know, when the government of China says, this is one of our top priorities and we're going to back it with, you know, with funding and policies, they're going to get this done. And it's important for them because they are the manufacturing hub of the world today. And so if they lose that, right, if they don't have the, uh, the low cost labor, then companies don't need to you know, outsource anything in China anymore. They'll just create, create the factories in their own country and use humanoid bots instead. They need to become the leader in the space. Um, and so you'll see that the significance of what they're, they're doing to try to counteract that. And then the other part of the conversation is that, you know, uh, it's one thing if a car is driving around and has eight cameras around it and taking videos of everything. It's another thing to have a humanoid bot walking in your home with cameras taking video of everything. This is, uh, I guess it, could, it it may not be as scary as I'm putting it out to be, because I mean, I'm sure that cell phones does the same thing today and you have the ability to sell a iPhone to, you know, to China. But this could be one of those things that there's a lot of uh, political restrictions and legislation that, you know, you know, you won't want to have a Chinese made bot available in US and vice versa. So the US and the Western countries need to step up. They need as countries, as governments to, in, to, to invest in this, to support these companies and make this, um, you know, to make this something that, uh, that instead of, you know, regulations and concerns about it, they need to make sure that this is supported because it's important for these reasons I just brought up. Yeah, I think that, you know, we're probably very likely to see a dynamic similar to what China has been able to do so far in the EV industry. It was something that the yeah. government of China recognized as a, of strategic importance. They kind of subsidized in the form of basically providing a lot of venture capital like startup money uh, to a number of companies to really invest in getting EVs off the ground. They had a proliferation, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of EV companies that got started, began competing with one another. And then it was really, you know, they used this market dynamic to weed down all of the competitors in the EV space to where, you know, now here in 2024, we have a couple of big players who are highly, highly competitive um, when you put them up against other EV manufacturers 
from around the world. And so, yeah, I, it's very interesting to observe China's ability to, to really set up a set up and fund a marketplace to create the type of competitive environment necessary to really refine and develop a technology at a high level. Um, and I, I would agree. I think that that's probably going to be a similar dynamic that we see playing out here with humanoid robots that all of a sudden, you know, it'll be nearly impossible to track all of the competitors that'll be in the space because it will be hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. Um, and then, you know, over the course of a couple of years, it'll start getting narrowed down to, okay, these 5, 10, 15, 20 are really the the giants in the space within China. And then whatever the most successful of those companies are, will be the ones that really um, come to more global significance over time. And And like you said, I think not only is the political environment a big factor in all of this, but also, you know, a lot of com- countries are facing population shifts that, you know, we're kind of below replacement. We've, we're going into declining overall populations and we need, you know, that's one of the reasons that we have these labor shortages is that our populations are declining instead of growing. And so we actually need, you know, more sources of labor to fill in the gaps as populations begin to age. Um, and that's definitely a huge dynamic motivating China as well, specifically because of the, you know, one child policy that was in place for so long. And they are very, very far below replacement rate at this point in time. And, um, you know, there's just not a whole lot of young people entering into the workforce compared to the number of existing, you know, adult aged people that are already in those positions. Yeah, I was going to say, going back to that conversation we had earlier about the the role that these bots will do. So people, you know, say, oh, you're being delusional. This is five years or longer before any of this will be useful. And I, I scratch my head thinking, are they right? Because I, I, but it depends on your definition. Because Digit today is showing that it can do useful work today in a customer's environment today. <laughs> because it can move, it can grab a box, it's called pick and place. It doesn't have to move very far. It just grabs an item, a tote, a package, uh, some item, and moves it to another place. And it can do that today. That's a very simple task. You don't need fancy you know, intelligence to be able to do that. I don't know why anybody would think that that's not accomplished, it's something you can accomplish today. When you already have the industrial robots already being able to identify packages and move them, why wouldn't you be able to do this? So that part is simple, pick and place. That will happen right now. It is happening right now. But then when you're talking about, you know, can a bot, you know, you know, make me coffee, get me a beer. Yeah, that could take years from now. Uh, that is correct. So it's just, I think it's critical we identify what do we mean by bots are coming and they're going to be here. There's going to be certain jobs that they're here. Um, they can be used today for search and rescue. And that could be the very first industry. It can be used today for logistics, distribution, and factory work. Now, different, like very specific kinds of work it can do. Very small number of the slices of tasks that it can do. Um, and the funny thing is that it, I don't think it's going to go to the, the retail environment, you know, the homes for a long time, except that if you look at these bot vendors and you look at their target market, the third target market for many of them is elder care. So the elder care demand is so big that they're and you know, Japan has been, that is where their focus has been for a decade is trying to create a companion for elders and helping them because that's going to be a crisis for them. And eventually all of us too, that could be the way that uh, the bots are then introduced into the home is through that route. Yeah. And I think I, I can point out the, the, the other thing with, as far as the utility is you might say, well, you know, there's two areas of good job shortages right now. I've got, you know, a, area A and area B. And, you know, I really, I, I've got to solve the, the problem over here in B. It's absolutely critical. And you're telling me your bot can only do the stuff over here at A. It's completely useless. It's like, no, it's not. What, what you're now doing is that because the bots can do this, you've now freed up the human workers over here 
and now they can be redeployed over to where they're critically needed. So all things like elderly care, part of that is that there's just a shortage of people. You know, there's all these other industries and places where we need workers there. And so naturally they all kind of go around. But if you're able to go into, you know, these, um, uh, these logistical areas and start taking care of some of those tasks, well, now those humans can be used to maybe do the more interesting tasks within that logistical fact uh, system, or maybe not as many are needed. And now the community has this other excess of people that can start taking on other, other jobs until the bots are able to sort of accomplish it there. So you, you have to realize it's, you know, it's, it's a wholesome game. You've got to look at everything that's going to be coming together to make the pieces working in the economy. So there is benefit. Yep. Every job that we're job shortage that we're able to replace now means there's another place that it then becomes available. Yeah, it's definitely going to be a thing where we're expanding the pie. And in fact, you know, it's not even necessarily just going to be embodied robotics that free up some of these jobs. For example, with elder care, I think, you know, one potential source of labor for elder care that's probably going to be freed up sooner rather than later is actually going to be, um, you know, customer service representatives working kind of at the that first level of customer service that you're seeing companies already today really automate a lot of that with agents that are, you know, LLM based and then are given some sort of, or some sort of um, ability to speak through something like 11 labs or whatever, where they can do real time text to speech. And so that's, you know, that's one example of an area where we're going to be, there's going to be some job destruction in the uh, process of creating a, an intelligent agent that can do some of those jobs. But then, you know, those people are freed up to then go do other things. And you're, over you know over the short term it does look very chaotic and very messy and very scary but over the long term what you're doing is you're continuing to free up more and more human hours and then through things like markets and the ability to exchange goods and services freely those humans um, end up gravitating towards areas where they can do something that's more fulfilling and gives them more money at the same time um, it just takes you know this is the exact path that really has characterized all of human history when you know if you go back just several hundred years ago almost every person on the planet had to spend a very large portion of their working time devoted to the production of food because we didn't have the technology necessary to make large amounts of food from a single person's labor now you know it one person who's working in food production can create food for thousands of people, which then frees up all kinds of time for humans to engage in other activities that, you know, they are able to exchange with one another and get value from. Um, and so I think that's going to be the, the process that we're looking at moving forward. Um, but one thing that that does highlight is, you know, I think a big component of, the design that's that's going to be the most effective at transforming the economy moving forward is going to be scalability that you know any of these companies that are able to solve a technical problem you know that is valuable but if they're not able to solve that at scale then it becomes you know it will just be another player who has that ability to scale, who's maybe adopting some of those technology as a fast follower. And so uh, of the companies that you see, which ones really look like they are on a good path to scale? I know that we've talked about agility robotics and, and digit. Um, Scott, this is a question for you maybe specifically is the actuators that digit uses, are those pretty readily available commercial actuators or do you know what they're doing um on that front uh and what does that kind of imply for their ability to scale to large numbers yeah i'm not aware of where they're getting their actuators uh they haven't said publicly whether they've sort of designed them themselves or not my suspicion is they probably are because i've i've spoken to a lot of companies that are are building their own bots and it seems like they've all come to the same conclusion that they had to do it they've just been a bit more quiet about doing it 
and they're able to build them. So it, it turns out it's not that hard to actually be able to build your own actuators if you know what you're doing. It's just that you can't build them at volume yet. But once they get their designs down, um, they'll either figure out how to come up with a production line with it, or they'll be able to partner with someone who can do it. So my suspicion is that they may be, in some cases, a lot of them are buying some commercial components that go in there and then they just get it to, you know, they might have to buy a gearbox or something like that or to buy some windings. But in the end, they need to scale it down to get the power density that they need to have. Um, so I suspect that's probably what they're doing. And again, we've pointed out many times that the actuators are the critical component to the bots for many reasons. You've got to have a good design because if you're using off the shelf, um, they're going to be too heavy and they're, they're going to be too power hungry. So you're trying to get something that is very light and has kind of the power density that you need in the torque requirements specifically for what you need, which is why they've all had to, to really customize uh, that. And the other is that's going to be your major bill of materials right there is that you've got, in many cases, these bots are uh, averaging at, at least 40 degrees of freedom. So you need to have 40 different actuators. And so right there, depending upon what, how much each actuator costs, if you say it's a thousand bucks each, that's $40,000 right there without even worrying about everything else. But if you can get that cost down, then you can bring it down quite a bit. So most of them realize that it's at least 50% or more of the cost of the bot will be the actuator. I suspect in the early days, it will be a lot higher than that. So most of them are, are saying they'd like to target between forty dollars and $50,000 as a cost for building the bot. I think they all realize they can probably go below that. But right now, they're being very conservative, saying that that's, that's about what the cost of production is going to be. And in fact, I think Unitree um, is selling their bot for $90,000 as, as like a, a research development platform. So we already know some of them are, are able to sell it for under $100,000. Mm -hmm. And this is going to be one of those areas where, um, you know, I'm just very fascinated by the work that they're doing over there at Stanford. And they kind of put that little um, research platform together and it's, you know, a couple thousand dollars worth of parts and um, actuators, but all the actuators that they're using are just like standard off the shelf. Um, they're like actually off the shelf uh, arms. So, so they went out to an arm supplier and they didn't even build the arms. They just bought the arms and then assembled them together. Yeah. And each yeah. arm I think is like around five or $6,000 um, that they're able to buy from the supplier. And, and the name of the supplier uh, escapes me right now, but if you go to the Aloha page, you'll find all that information. Mm -hmm. So just off the top of your head, where roughly is Aloha in the number of degrees of freedom that the entire, you know, if you have two arms, um, how many degrees of freedom are you looking at there? Okay. So each of their arms is six degrees of freedom. So the, um, the arms that all the robot manufacturers are coming up with are actually a seven degree of freedom arm. They have an extra degree of freedom in the shoulder and that allows you to move your elbow up and down. So they call that the elbow redundancy, even though it's in the shoulder. Uh, the Aloha bot is actually a standard industrial cobot which there's two versions, one which is the telerobotic arm that they manipulate, which is basically the, the lead arm. And then you have the follower arms, which are the ones that are doing it. So they're each six mm -hmm. degrees of freedom. So if you think about the bots themselves are just 12 degrees of freedom, and then they're on a stand and the stand is a, is a mobile bot. So it's got basically the wheels that go around. So essentially two degrees of freedom there. And then they have very simple grippers like this. So the whole idea is to have the absolute minimum degrees of freedom. I mean, about as bare minimum as you get to be able to do these tasks and then to show that you with good neural networks, you can go ahead and actually do a very complicated task. In this case, the good, good neural network is the human brain because it's all being done telerobotically. And then if the training set's good enough, it seems like it's actually able to autonomously repeat many of those tasks. Gotcha. And so if you include the, um, you know, the grippers, you're looking at, and it was running in autonomous road mode, you'd be looking at something with 14 degrees of freedom and yeah, for 14 degrees of freedom. And then if you have like the manipulate, the, the fact that you have a mobile stand that's on. So I think a total of 16, sort of like 16 actuators altogether. Yeah. Gotcha. And what would you just ballpark the cost of that? Oh, that, that whole thing or, came out oh, around $30,000. And that, and basically they bought four arms. So you, you have like the two arms that are here mm -hmm. and you get the two arms in the back. Oh, so that was, was like even six, with the six to seven. Yeah. Yeah. So then when they put the whole thing together, 
they give you, you can actually go to the Aloha website and they'll give the bill of materials and everything you need to buy to put it together. So the whole idea is it's very much open source. Mm -hmm. So I think it was in the order of around uh, $30,000 for, for everything. The reason that I bring that up is because it does kind of put a nice, like, rough target for where these robots kind of should be if you, like, priced it per actuator or per degree mm -hmm. of freedom. And mm -hmm. then you can kind of use that to So, so that would be score. about 30 degrees of freedom because, remember, that that's with also the telerobotic arm behind it, which let's say, oh, we don't need the telerobotic arm. Let's get rid of it. Once it's autonomous, now you're able to take about 10 grand out of it because I think one of the arms is like five or six grand. The other one, you know, one was a little bit more expensive than the other. I'm not sure why, maybe because what the telerobotic arm required a bit more uh, kind of degrees of freedom or uh, encoders that would be in there. So the, um, so yeah, that gives you a ballpark idea there that you could say, we know we can do it for a thousand an actuator. Yeah. Yeah. Once you can use actuators that are really have reached economies of scale and, and you mm -hmm. can make, in large quantities and um, to the, the levels of precision and stuff that you need. So, cool. is there anything, Herbert, that you wanted to jump in with here? I do. Yeah. So, I think it's worthwhile to for us to explore a little bit further. Like, when would these humanoid bots be able to actually do a job at a customer site? And it's a high bar because they need to be able to do what what we term useful work. And Scott has done a fantastic job explaining what that is. And I think it's important for him to share that now. What is useful work? What are the uh, aspects that a human bot needs to be able to do? All of it to be able to then for a customer to say, yes, this is going to be worthwhile for me to deploy this bot versus you know hiring another human to do it or, or continuing to find somebody to replace that role. Yeah. So. Uh I tried to make the definition of, of useful work pretty straightforward and simple without it having all sorts of numbers at attached to it. So more of a, a very, um, well, you know, the qualities that we're looking for. And the main thing is like, identify tasks that are currently being done on the shop floor, that need, need to be done and replace it with a humanoid bot without changing anything else with the configuration. You're not allowed to bring in any safety equipment or reconfigure or new, new tooling, just basically a one-to-one -one swap out. So you, that you have to be able to do that. And it has to be able to perform the task at the same level as a human. So in other words, the same cycle time, the same kind of repeatability, um, the, the, the same quality of performing that particular task and it needs to have the endurance. In other words, it has to be able to go an entire shift and it can't take breaks when the humans aren't taking the breaks. So you need to look at all those things. And then the final thing is like, okay, we can perform all those things, but it has to do it at cost parity. If it can't do it at cost parity, there's absolutely no point. I'm going to continue to hire the human to do that if the human is going to be cheaper. So you need to get to that level. And it seems that a lot of these bots are getting, let's say, close to that. What we don't know is whether they're able to do it with um, sufficient endurance because they can demonstrate that they can perform some of these tasks. And we don't know how costly it's going to be. And figuring out that cost gets a little bit tricky because there may be some robot wranglers and others that are kind of on the payroll along with it that are minding it. So you got to make sure that's kind of in the cost. But if you're saying, yeah, but that's no different than the managers we have to make, they also keep track with the human. So you got to, the accountants have to kind of figure that thing out and they'll be very good at that. I mean, that's what the bean counters are there for. They're going to run the calculation. They're going to say, yes, this is saving us money. We're going to go ahead with that. And then they're going to look at the quality. So if it's producing, um, inferior parts, you're not going to put it in there. It, 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 you, you have to, whatever it's doing in that production scenario. Now there's many things that go on in a factory, which are very simple that do not require, um, you know, moving a box from here to there, just as so long as you don't drop the thing and get it on the conveyor and do it in a timely manner. That's good enough. Whereas there might be other operations with very delicate pick and place that you have to get them in there and you have to feed it at a certain rate that maybe they can't quite do it yet that you need to make sure, okay, is it fast enough? Can I drop it in there without jamming the system all the time that slows everything down? That's not going to be very good quality. So that means their error rates have to go down and their, their endurance. And ideally, that not only does it make it through a shift, but it can actually show up the next day without like a whole lot of maintenance and everything else going on overnight to make sure, whew, you know, it's like a boxer done with the, the boxing match. You're going to go through and repair the whole thing. So you've got to make sure the overall cost of running that thing is less than whatever the human wage is. 
So, you know, in order to understand what is human work, uh, what is useful work, what uh, we've done is, you know, CERN Basher, Scott and I, we've put together this uh, analysis of what is a true business case that a company would be able to evaluate whether or not certain roles and certain jobs that they would have is today, or maybe in at some point in the future, is it worthwhile to replace with a human bot and which vendors? We formed a company called Human Bots, along with John Gibbs, and the four of us have created this company. It's going to create business cases for companies. So if you are a company today, factory or otherwise, and you want to know what is the business case of humanoid bots and even human scale bots? You know, these are bots that are not necessarily the humanoid ones, but are available. We've got the largest database. We are actually evaluating whether or not which vendors can actually sell it at what time to be able to do useful work. Many of these vendors are now saying that they their bots can last for four hours, their batteries can last for four hours. But you know, that's in according to you know Scott and CERN's analysis, that is enough because you can take a bot and have them work 24 hours a day if as long as you have a four hour battery because just like humans they would take a 10 minute break here a 15 minute break here maybe a 30 minute lunch time and if they take those same breaks that humans do they would be able to you know they evaluated how much the battery can actually be recharged in those minutes and then be able to continue work and it's true they've calculated that it can work for 24 hours as long as you have a four hour battery and then you have to now consider just all the cons, the whole idea of uh, is this make, does this, is this something that's worthwhile for the business? Which job's going to do? Like some of these bots, that is Scott's watching very carefully. They can walk faster. It's still not quite there. Uh, they're, they're not yet at the speed where they need to walk as fast as a human. But the, the part that they're really slow at is pivoting, you know, being able to turn. Humans can turn very quickly, but uh, bots can't yet. So these are things that we're very carefully measuring and, and, and making sure we understand very carefully. So uh, that's the kind of stuff that we're really focused on today. Yeah, that, that's what I'm calling kind of the little pirouette maneuver that they would make. We know that when we have to grab something off the table and bring it to something behind us, we can do a quick maneuver in almost one step. And I don't think it's necessarily a mechanical problem because it looks like they have enough degrees of freedom to be able to do it. It just may be a matter of training and the control system being able to do it and feeling that they can do it with the correct stability. So I think it's just a matter of time before they really be able to figure out that quick pivoting maneuver. So when we looked at both, you know, digit is at like 75% of doing this particular human task. And it's pretty clear to me, it's like, well, you can make up that 25% just with the pivots of both ends that you're missing that. Just get that down and then they'll be able to do it. And the other advantage of that is that if they can get that pivot and do it really quickly, I think they'll also save energy. So, so that means also be able to run a little bit longer. So there, there's all these places that they'll actually, with more economic movements, be able to perform it in the better cycle time without actually having to drain more power. And again, just to reiterate what, what Herbert talked about is that when the human bots go into the factory right now, they're not replacing all the humans. They're just going to be taking over a small percentage of the tasks, uh, which means they're going to be subject to the same break schedules that all the humans are. And, um, so during those those break schedules, you know, morning coffee breaks, um, afternoon coffee breaks, lunch breaks, there's more than enough to be able to kind of top off the battery to make sure it can make it through the end of the day. And then there's usually a break between shifts and the next one, and they can continue to go and continue to go. So that could be done. Um, and that also depends upon how it's being used. So when we examined the Tesla bot, we said four hour battery life running at maximum, though we know it can do eight hours if it goes at what they believe is going to be like the average consumption rate no problem is able to make it through and then if you are actually running it at you know what would probably be the more average one it gets even easier to do it so you always have excess capacity even when you get near there so uh, that means yeah they will be able to do that they become very useful and then finally i think what's going to happen in most cases these bots are not going to be sold to the customer they're going to be used as a service it's going to be a leasing service so the, the bot companies are gonna figure out how much it actually is costing them to operate this thing hourly. And they're gonna go in there, gonna make a proposal and we'll say, this bot is gonna cost you $10 an hour. Guaranteed, we'll, we'll, we'll do the job and everything like that, but it's only gonna be $10 an hour and that's it. And it's gonna be up to the bot manufacturer to then make sure it really only costs them $10 an hour to operate. So uh, they will definitely have the incentive to make sure they can get it down there because they need to be able to make a profit as well. Or at first they might eat it a little bit because they were going to realize the data and the experience they get is going to be worth it. 
And that's something they would normally be paying for anyway. So they'll be more than willing to go in there and find a competitive rate. One of our partners is CERN Basher, and he's put together amazing business cases, like very thorough business cases, and showing the value of the humanoid bots to both the vendor, but also the customer. And given all these constraints that Scott has talked about, it is, <laughs> you know, it's pretty nutty. The value to the customer is crazy incredible. Um, and we have all sorts of sliders, right? You can you know, decide if you don't agree that a bot can work for three chefs. What if it can only do one chef? instead of two chefs or three chefs. And what if it, you know, it, it's not as fast as a human? Uh, what if it's only half as fast as a human? Every one of these criteria, you know, you can see in a spreadsheet and you can work it out. At the end of the day, it's still very, very uh, lucrative for both the customer and the vendor. It's crazy how how much value these human robots can deliver. And then, and then it's just even crazier when you start realizing that at some point, not only will the bots eventually get to be as fast as a human, there's no reason why it could be twice as fast or three mm -hmm. times as fast at some point. And then maybe they don't need as many uh, fleet managers to control them, you know, eventually, because when one bot learns one thing, all the bots know that one task. So it becomes interchangeable. You could take any bot and be able to do any tasks pretty quickly. So. Yeah. And I think the, the other thing to talk about the, the models we worked on with CERN is we've had the chance to, to talk, with a, a lot of the industry insiders and um, yeah. kind of yeah. look at how the models they're putting together. And it's like th th their models are very similar to ours. They're coming to the exact same conclusions as we are, and they came to it independently. So, you know, for, for example, CERN has worked out that each bot is basically worth like three and a half workers because of the number of hours that that bot can do per year, you would need three and a half workers to do that. So that means take whatever salary you're paying a particular worker to do a particular task and multiply by three and a half. That's how much money you're spending to get that operation done every year. So that's how much value the, the bot has. So if, if a worker is being paid $50,000 already, it's like, oh, okay, three and a half. Wow. Already we're getting close to $200,000 in value right there. Um, for one and bot. what you're paying for that bot for, for one worker. Well, actually three workers probably, or three and a half workers, because you would have to be doing for three shifts and everything else. So, uh, they were coming up with like, like the same numbers, the size of, of the labor market, everything else we were looking at that. And, and we're just thinking, man, they, these, these people, they, 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 they must have, uh, bugs in our, our phones or something like that. And listening to the discussions that CERN and, and Herbert and I are having, cause they're coming up with the exact same conclusions. I think that's what it comes down to when you take sort of a first principles approach, like all of them are doing is that, you know, the numbers and the numbers, the conclusions you get are going to be very, very similar. So, so you know, every now and then we, we might have, uh, you know, here or there a little bit of a difference or of opinion, but it's because we don't quite know what the numbers are. In many cases, we're all being way conservative because when you run it, you say, oh, these numbers are just too crazy if I really present this as, as what we believe the numbers are, no one's going to take us for serious. So in many cases, everyone's taking the numbers and dividing by a factor of 10. That's, that's how insane the potential market is. Because again, remember, half of GDP is the labor market, half of worldwide GDP. And so think about it right there. If you were able to somehow you know, replace that market or, or have an industry, which is labor. That's what it, it potentially represents. And it doesn't mean that it's going to take over all of that labor market. It just means you get a percentage of that market and you will be able to do very well. And quickly you're at the same scale as like automotive or oil or any of the largest companies you can think of today. Yes. Hans, can you showcase the, uh, the table again? Cause another point I'd like us to, to talk about and and I think Scott agrees with me. I don't know, Hans, if you do. This idea that uh, the market is so massive that if Tesla succeeds, and, and they will, they're going to incredibly succeed. They're going to be able to create, produce um, millions and millions and millions of bots once they have you know, their, their expertise in manufacturing and their expertise in AI and just everything. They've, this is lined up perfectly for them. It doesn't mean that figure can't also succeed at incredible market share for themselves, nor can agility and sanctuary. Basically, anybody who 
gets past this, you know, do you have enough funding? Do you have enough employees, the intelligent employees to build you the right AI, the right hardware? Can you build these bots at a certain price point? And are they useful? If you can get past that bar and you survive past that, you're not going to lose because, oh, I lost a sale because Tesla figure or some other company beat me to it. The market is so massive that there's going to be supply constrained for five to 10 years from now. And only 10 plus years later, maybe they're going to rub shoulders against each other. And so th this is, I just don't see this as one company is competing with another. They're, they're competing for bragging rights. Um, but it just doesn't feel like, you know, that, that every one of these companies, if they can pass that, uh, that, you know, that hurdle of, cause this is expensive. This is one of the hardest things to ever do, build these human and robots. If you could do it. Um, and that's why I love agility and digit, their approach. They're not trying to copy everybody else. They're really focused on a very specific pick and place task at this point. And there's a designing for that. There's going to be a role for them. There'll be many, many jobs for them to sell, to, to take over that job and, and do very, very well as a business. Do you guys agree? Do you agree, Hans? Yeah, I think that, at least from my perspective, the competition is like what you were talking about is if they can achieve funding and if they can acquire talent and those things. And that's actually where the competition is. That yeah. there's a fixed, you know, there's a somewhat limited amount of capital that's going to be flowing into this field. There's a somewhat limited number of people who have the talents to do this work. And so as these companies really try and compete against each other, it's really going to be for dominance in the ability to raise capital, to acquire talent, and to create partnerships that allow them to really succeed from you know the technological standpoint. Um, and I think those constraints really will probably narrow this field down a long ways. And I mean, I'll just go back to the same analogy that we talked about earlier with EVs that at the beginning, EVs in China, you know, they, they had way more different brands all pursuing that. Ultimately, the competition is between EVs and ICE vehicles. Like EVs as a class are going to outcompete ICE vehicles as a class over the next 10, 15, 20, 30 years, because the cost declines of ICE or, you know, the cost increases of ICE are being layered on top of EVs getting cheaper and cheaper every year. And so, you know, ultimately it's very obvious that that's going to lead to EVs over the long run just being cheaper than ICE and because they're cheaper, more people are going to choose those and that's just going to be the way that the industry goes. The same thing will be said here for humanoid robotics companies is that there's going to be so much labor for these humanoid robotics companies to do that's value added. And you can even think, you know, if they can get their costs down to where they can provide instead of, you know, uh, it's important to make the distinction of what's the economic opportunity for these robotics companies today so they have a market TAM to go pursue. But ultimately, think about the types of goods and services that are going to be available to humanity if you have a fleet of billions of robots that can all do work for useful work profitably for the company that made it for something like $1 an hour instead of 15 or $20 an hour. You know, that's the the type of world that we could potentially be living in in the not too distant future is that, you know, the, the cost of value added labor could dramatically shrink, which would make products and services that we all want to consume incredibly cheap and allow, you know, people who don't make very much money to still be able to enjoy goods and services that are you know, goods and services that today only the richest of the rich can enjoy. Um, and, but in the process of all of that, you know, there's going to be a season of competition with these early stage companies um, to pursue the beginning sets of these markets. And then it's going to evolve and, you know, there'll be kind of a, a continual refresh of new competitors coming into the space after markets have been proved out and, um, you know, just kind of rinse and repeat 
through various cycles as the technology progresses in getting more and more capable and bringing costs down and um and then those you know those markets actually get opened up yeah i i think that um even when we speak to the individuals from these different companies none of them think that they have to worry about the competition from the other company not necessarily because they're like oh we're much better than them or they're or they're not going to succeed they're like the tam is so big we just won't be able to produce enough uh, if we want to um i kind of agree with you there there was a little bit of a capital constraint I don't think it's with funding. Uh, Figure was oversubscribed. I think others, when they go through their funding rounds, will be oversubscribed as well. So there's going to be more than enough money. What it really comes down to is the the talent pool that's out there. And when you look at all these videos that are out there, you think it's really like one of them trying to one up the other company or something like that, or trying to inform us to get us all excited about this. No, at the bottom of every one of them, it's a recruiting pitch, right? At the bottom, please join our team. Please join our team. That's what the point of all these videos are, is that they realize that right now, the capital constraint is not funding. It's actually people with experience in the area, people with the talent. So right now they're trying to figure out how do I start poaching these people from these other industries right now to get them over and start getting excited about that. So that's what's really going on. Probably why you're gonna start seeing more of this is it has nothing to do with prepping the consumers and or, or even trying to excite you know, future investors. It really comes down to, we need people to come help us build these bots. Will you do it for us? And so what I'll finish on is like, if right now you are a university student, really talk to your professors and your advisors and say, I wanna get into this. What are the courses I should be taking right now? And if you're applying to a university, ask them about it. And if they don't really have the courses that are going to, let's say, help you understand how these are, then maybe you wanna apply somewhere else because this is going to be an exciting area for anyone who is going to be getting an engineering degree. Yep. Or if you don't want to go to school for it right now, just get into 3D printing or, you know, start tinkering, you know, join a, a makerspace, those type of like the types of skills that you develop in those projects are all very much applicable to this field today. Uh, this is a fun topic, a fun debate that uh, Scott and I have. I don't even know that I think it's a debate because I automatically will lose because it's Scott. <laughs> the idea is, can humanoid bots make humanoid bots? And I say yes, because if you look at Tesla's demos, they showed a humanoid, they're Optimus making Optimus. Scott says, no, these bots are not going to be made by human. They're going to be all automated. So where do you stand on well, that, Scott? Let's, well, where I stand is that, I mean, for instance, the actuator line. I see that as being automated just the same way like the, the, the battery line is. So um, you need specialized automated equipment for that. But at some point, all the pieces need to get assembled together. And that's where I imagine there's going to be these workbenches where people are going to bring in these components and just start putting them together like IKEA furniture. And yeah, that's, that's where the humanoid bots will be. So it won't be doing all of it, but it, it'll be in there somewhere. And I think that what that assembly plant looks like is going to be really interesting. It's not going to be your traditional kind of conveyor line that you would think of it. I think it's really going to be a series of um, workstations just kind of scattered around that eventually the bots will figure out will be the most efficient kind of placement to be able to put these things together, just looking for the flow of material. But yeah, I agree. We, we've already seen the arms being put on. There's no reason why you can't do that. It's just something like the guts of the actuators you know, the windings and stuff like that. You're going to have a winding machine for that. But who knows? At some point, there might be a stage where the winding gets you know, put into the casing itself. And that's like, oh, okay, maybe that's something you either, you know, have an automated piece of equipment to do it, or no, these two components come out and, and a bot goes ahead and assembles that. And it'll be up because, to them to decide where it makes sense. Because if humanoid bots can actually make other humanoid bots, then it becomes this thing where the company who has the largest manufacturing, you know, at the most scale, will kind of like exponentially grow faster than all the others. And mm -hmm. so they will be able to fill in the billions of jobs that are opening up or available for them faster than the others can. And there could become one or two or three, you know, a handful of big winners and the rest are little fish. Well, well think about it this way. I mean, would you buy a bot from a bot manufacturer whose bots can't even make themselves? What's the point? I mean, that, that, that's, that's the first thing. It's like, if your bots can't put themselves together, how are they going to put this other stuff together? Yeah, that's, I mean, that's a good way to look at it. I would say 
the practically how it's going to play out is really going to be, you know, the bots themselves are, you know, that's one level of a supply chain, but they're all going to have these very massive, you know, complex supply chains. It's going to stretch all the way from raw materials and, you know, electronics and, and all sorts of different areas. And so I think, you know, just the market will decide where is the best place in that whole supply chain for a bot to begin to replace some labor. Some of it may be in the assembly of the robot itself, but, you know, maybe it actually makes more sense for it to be working in the steel plant or, you know, the titanium plant or, you know, some mm -hmm. other port. And one of the places that it's not going to replace any time too soon, I don't think, is in the IC fab. You know, that that's going to be one of the bottlenecks that if you've ever, you know, really started playing around with creating 3D printers and like, oh, I now I have a 3D printer. The 3D printer can make the parts for the 3D printer. I can just, you know, make endless 3D printers with the first 3D printer that I get. And then you're like, wait a second, every single one of these needs to have computer brains in it. And a uh, 3D printer doesn't make computer brains. And so, right. you know, that's going to be chip one of those. When you go in there, there are still people that are working in the clean rooms. Yep. There's still a lot of manual tasks that are done in there. And then the problem with the clean rooms is that first the people got to get in the room, they got to get out of the room, right? They got to change their shifts. The people have to, to be um, where the proper dressing and everything else. You got to have all the filtration. Now you put the bots in there. You don't get people in there ever again. The, the bots is going to stay in there. They don't have to go home. They can just stay in there. And then, you know, maybe occasionally they come out of an airlock because some maintenance has to be done, but then again, the maintenance can be done there or you do it outside because mm -hmm. you, you want the maintenance to be done in, in a different area rather than in a clean room. So I could see that that will help the chip fabs perhaps run more efficiently and with higher quality because now you don't have to worry about the fact that impurities are being brought in by humans. So there, mm -hmm. there, there could definitely be a lot of places the work are done. But I think the analogy is that, you know, remember in the, way, way, way back before Gutenberg, you had monks that were basically copying books and they were doing that. Now, if we want, we could get bots to start doing the, the publishing of books for us now. They could just sit there with a fountain pen and they could start writing out all the books. But I think we would agree we could pump out books a lot faster and a lot cheaper just using a printing press. So that's what it's going to be. Is there's going to be certain things that still are going to make sense to use dedicated hard automation and others where it makes more sense to go ahead and say, oh, that, that could be done by a human. So maybe taking the, the book and putting it into the bag, you know, it's like that's done by a human. It's not going to be done by a piece of paper. Yep. And it'll be interesting. This is a whole different conversation, but at some point we should talk about, you know, or continue the conversation really about the concept of hard automation and how does that change as you make those machines a lot smarter with the exact same software algorithms that we're going to be developing with the humanoid robots to begin with. So um, that will blur the lines somewhat and be exciting and interesting as well. Now, um, what's, what, what I think is one of the most interesting things to finish on is, is um, uh, a, a friend of mine that's uh, a senior now uh, in university is taking a class in, uh, in manufacturing, and they're talking about uh, the Industry 5.0. And I, like, I just kind of like, wait, Industry 5.0? I mean, it's like they just coined the term Industry 4.0 not even a decade ago. And that's something that's that is supposed to be the the way forward. So basically, it's like the fourth industrial revolution, which is why it's called Industry 4.0. And they're already talking about 5.0 and the differences between 4.0. And I said, well, send me the agenda there because I'd like to look at that to see what they're talking about. And it's sort of like emerging AI, humanoid bots, you know, a lot of these other things that suddenly the landscape has shifted so quickly that even 10 years ago, they were not predicting this and that we're looking at the fifth industrial revolution. And as far as I'm concerned, we haven't even completed the fourth one. We're still like part way in there, just transitioning. How, how can we already be in the fifth? Technology moves fast. And there's a lot of companies that have, you know, carved out a profitable business for themselves and they don't necessarily have to change yet before they die, but that will change. Well, thank you so much. This was a great conversation today. Is there anything that y'all want to kind of end on beyond what we've discussed so far? I don't I mean, know. I think as Farzad says, uh, the robots are coming. The robots yeah. are here. 
Herbert says the robots are here. Robots are yeah, here. Yeah, the robots are no, here. No, I mean, I think that it is March 4th, and uh, Scott and I joke around, but literally starting January 1st, we have had breaking news every single day, almost you know, at least two or three a week for sure, from each one of these bots. And they are f happening faster and faster than we realize. They're accomplishing tasks that we didn't think were going to happen soon. And so I do still get these comments saying, you're being delusional. Bots aren't going to be here for five years or longer. And I'm asking myself, are we being delusional when we are watching this happening every single week? These tasks are being, uh, you know, these milestones are being accomplished. Um, and like I said earlier, if you define it as, you know, pick and place in a very specific area, that's already being done today. There's bots, humanoid bots that can do that today. So I don't, I don't understand why some people think it's going to be five years from now. So it's happening very fast. And Scott and I are on top of it. And so we are uh, formed this company called Human Bots, and we are creating the largest, most comprehensive database, not only for humanoids, but also human scale bots. So think any intelligent lawnmower and bathroom cleaners and waiter delivery bots. We want to have the, the kind of the, the most knowledge of all the bots out there. And then we're going to put our own rating and specifications and to say, these are the ones that are truly viable. They're the ones that are worth possibly buying depends on your situation. And that's where we're trying to get to is because it's just an explosion. There's just going to be so many things. Anything with a camera is going to be intelligent. And so <laughs> it's just going to be a crazy world where we're going to be headed towards. Yeah, abs absolutely. absolutely. And, and, and I think I'll just finish up with sort of the, the baseball analogy again. And that uh, a lot of times we know that some of the, the best teams in the field have a really good front office. And, you know, the news today was that Agility is, uh, was the first day for their new CEO, uh, Peggy Johnson. And she's definitely, you know, again, she, she's a heavy hitter. You look at some of the others that are in there. Yeah, they've got a, a good front office. And you can only get a good front office if they believe in the mission, if they, if they know what's going on. When you start seeing these moves, you begin to know this is, this is not a hype cycle that we're going through. It, it really is legitimate. Um, they are going to be coming. We're going to see more and more of them. Uh, a lot of those who are looking closely are going to see the gains happening pretty quickly, but it still may be a few more years before the public at large realizes what's really going on because it's going to be kind of a slow infusion in there. And then suddenly it's going to ramp up. So a lot of progress is going to happen this year. It's laying the groundwork for what's going to be an exciting rest of the decade for sure. And, and to clarify, I'm not saying that there's going to be a million bots uh, delivered and scaled this year. No, <laughs> all right. these bot companies is going to take them two, two years or longer to get even just handfuls of bots out there. But what I point is that, you know, if you look at the criteria required to do useful work to be able to build the three areas, right? Which is the brains, the hand dexterity, the lo locomotion, the, the hardware and the brains and AI. Uh, it's looking like that that is a, you know, on its way to, you know, there's gonna be a lot of other hurdles to hit, but it's really on its way that it's gonna be able to be able to do some useful work anyways. Well, and one of the things that will make it interesting, I think, from the perspective of a lot of people is that we'll be able to ship millions and millions of robots over you know, the next five to 10 years into jobs that most people don't see. And most people mm -hmm. won't even realize how much traction, you know, I think that's one of the things about agility specifically is, and we see it in the charts of Amazon, like the, the ratio of robots to people that Amazon yeah. as a company has and how that's growing so quickly. I think that's going to be happening in a number of large companies, but most people won't even see yeah. it, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, they won't think about it. And so unless you're really paying attention to the actual deployments of these robots into commercial use cases, you'll think that, oh yeah, you know, robots aren't, they're a long way away, even though they're highly profitable, highly applicable, highly capable, um, even, even now. So that's a, a great piece of perspective. Thank you so much for all of the hard work that y'all have put into not only understanding the space, but then all of the live streams that you do to explain what all's going on for everyone. I really appreciate you joining me today to share a little bit more of just the takeaways that you have on this area for the audience. And I hope that everyone has a great day. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Bye now.